All right. So again, those of you online, thanks for hanging with us. Uh, unfortunately, this last presentation we can't show to you because of a malfunction. Uh, you can hear, hear us in audio, um, and we'll post the PowerPoint later. You can just enjoy that at your leisure. And again, uh, here's Ben Luna to tell us about this ongoing project. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, so just a little bit of background here. I'm a hydrologist with an engineering background. I joined Western Water, uh, working with these guys last year. And the idea here is, as you've heard today, that beetles um, and climate are very sort of complex interaction, uh, not to mention dust, which I'm going to talk about. And one way that we can get at that is through <coughs> use of models as a guide. Ideally, if we can constrain the models well enough, then we can start to say something um, maybe a little bit skillful about what's going on and start to unravel the different perturbations. So I'd just like to acknowledge my co-authors here, uh, mostly at EU, INSTAR, and of course at Western Water. Okay, so what we're trying to do is to quantify impacts to changes in uh, attachments in the Colorado Headwaters region. So this is part of a broader Western Water Assessment project that's looking at snowmelt perturbation. And it's designed to inform um, inform water managers of potential uh, planning, to improve their planning efforts uh, for what to expect with these things. Uh, on one hand, we have there are stakeholders like Denver Water that are concerned with water supply, whereas on the other hand, we have uh, stakeholders like the River Forecast Center who are uh, worried about things like flooding. So kind of the two ends of the spectrum there. So we talked a lot about bark beetle today, so fortunately I won't have to give you any background information. Also, uh, the desert dust on snow, or perhaps most, most accurately dry land dust on snow, um, has been an issue creating a darker snowpack. And we're really looking at uh, what are the impacts on hydrology. So to get at this, we'll use modeling and observations and hopefully begin to come up with some expected outcomes. This is still fairly early along in the project. OK, so the bark beetle impact uh, is it, prevalent in North America. Um, and as they've become more prevalent in the Colorado Headwater, Headwaters region, which is a vital water, water resource, a lot more interest has come about. And much of what has been done has been focused on the plot scale studies that look at individual tree stands, and not that much has been done looking at large scale today in terms of integrating these sort of plot scale impacts on hydrology. And that's what prompted this, this project. So the work that I'm going to show today pretty much goes up until the gray phase. And I'm really only going to show a few scenario-driven analyses today uh, with that. So um, the other disturbance, of course, is this dust on snow. And uh, here's a picture from the San Juan Mountain. I believe this is the same image that you saw uh, in Jeff's presentation. Basically, the take-home message from um, dust is that it changes the reflectivity of the snow pack. And that really becomes important, if you can see the difference here between the, the dust either, or dirty snow versus the clean in the spring when you have a whole lot of solar energy coming uh, into the picture and it makes that solar energy a whole lot more efficient at melting snow. So that means earlier melting uh, water management decisions, uh, things like that. Okay, so it is a modeling framework and we selected four basins in the um, sort of headwaters region that have a diversity of bark beetle impact as well as a diversity of dust in that. And they, they have slightly different uh, uh, hydroclimatic properties, if you will. Uh, the Uncompahgre River, which is probably is certainly the most proximal to us, would probably be the most relevant to today's discussion. So we are going to inform the model with ground-based observations, also aerial survey data uh, from the Forest Service and the uh, and satellite imagery. So this is a very coarse schematic model. Uh, we selected this model, the distributed hydrology soil vegetation model. doesn't exactly roll off the tongue uh, because it gives us a, um, it does a separate calculation 
for an independent canopy layer and an understory layer. So the reason that that is useful, as you can imagine, is we can um, change the parameters of the canopy to emulate beetle impacts and uh, even turn off the transpiration associated with the roots of the canopy uh, to try to emulate, in a coarse sense, what a uh, beetle infestation might do. And through that, explore sensitivities uh, to bark beetle and dust. And the, the dust, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about, but we can get at that through changing the reflectivity of the snow. So this model takes precipitation for things like uh, uh, co-op stations and so on and integrates it. It has a snow model, so it models the evolution of the snow. Model. And we can get at things like that. OK, so the study basins. Just another look at them here. There's four basins. And what I'm showing you here is from the, the National Land Cover Database, how it categorizes the, the, um, the land cover in terms of vegetation. And if you just look over on the, the left, the left-hand side, you can see a range of areas from about 60 square kilometers to about almost 400. So we have a, a bit of a range there. Looking a bit closer at these basins, um, here is a, a more detailed land cover map. And so you have different types of land cover, very generally labeled as evergreen deciduous mixed forest. The area of main concern here is a sort of chalky green color, which corresponds with the evergreen area, which uh, would be susceptible conceivably to bark fields. So um, a PhD student at CU is helping me with some of this. He went through and took the Forest Service aerial survey data. Hopefully I'm setting that correctly. And now what's shaded in brown is all areas that have had some beetle impact uh, between 2002 and 2011. So you can see those areas have been susceptible uh, to beetle impacts. And then one step further, we went through and looked at severities. Uh, we've since actually, in the last week or so, updated the severities a little bit. Uh, so these are not necessarily the final numbers, but you can see that there is a range of severities, which makes a lot of difference when we try to model it to try to get it right. OK, so the experiment. Oh, actually, one last thing. Um, I pulled together some time series of beetle severity for each day. And so the solid line speaks to severity of beetle impact in terms of trees per acre. So you can see in each basin, uh, in red phase, which I suppose for the spruce beetle would actually correspond to more of a yellow or brown phase, um, is, is in red. And then the gray phase is in gray. And you can see that actually um, over time, especially in, in the Uncompagra, you can see periods where the red phase is essentially converted into gray phase, which is what I'm gathering uh, at this point, still somewhat preliminary. Um, and then in terms of the total acreage affected, those are the dash. So the solid lines are the severity, the dash line for the acreage. Generally, uh, everywhere you have acreage either staying constant or increasing, uh, where the severity is, is more variable, particularly in the, in the red phase. OK. So an example of the experiment uh, that we're running here. So what we're doing is we're changing uh, leaf area in the LAI, which is essentially just the total amount of leaf structure in the canopy. And we're using that to sort of uh, characterize the severity of beetle kill. Um, we initially wanted to use MODIS, which is a, a fairly high resolution satellite, to do that. And you can see these are maximum LAI values from two different years. And there is some sensitivity there, but because of mixing with the understory, and as we've heard today, the understory can recover and so forth. Uh, we found that we needed an additional sort of piece of information, which is where this, this area of survey data came in. Um, and then we're using a, an also fairly complex um, snow water equivalent product to spatially distribute precipitation in the winter. I'm not going to talk too much about that, but we're trying to just know that we're, we've spent quite a bit of time trying to account for that. So the first experiment, uh, case one, and this should actually be bark beetle, not, not the pine beetle there. Um, essentially, I've applied the maximum bark beetle impact to all evergreen trees within a basin. 
So this is just assuming that um, you've had a synchronous attack everywhere. The second case is applying a maximum spark fatal impact, meaning reduction in release area, to just those areas that have actually had observed extent in the past, uh, the, the period of 2002 to 2011. And then the third case, perhaps more realistic, is to do with um, a graded impact. So you have more and less severity to different areas. Okay, so those are the, the three scenarios. As I said, right now we're just in the sort of scenario-driven stage. Okay, some results. Um, snow water equivalent, which is important for water managers. We found that the bark beetle impacts lead to higher accumulation of snow water equivalent. Um, and this is due to uh, reduced canopy interception, as Tarek was talking about this morning, uh, which means less sublimation. In fact, um, some new studies have come up to show that actually What's at play here is sort of a tug of war between less sublimation at the canopy, but now you have more melt and sublimation in the under canopy because you have exposure to light. So in this case, the uh, reduced sublimation is sort of winning out, and I've plotted sort of a control case here uh, versus a sort of graded scenario here. And it's hard to see a difference, but I've plotted a difference map. And across the board, we're essentially seeing slightly more snow water equivalent on April 1. Again, it's difficult to, to get at some of these um, some of these changes, and this is for the Snake River, um, simply because between a year like 2011 and 2002, wet versus dry, uh, we're seeing about a 300% difference in snowpack, whereas the pine beetle impact at very most is less than 30, uh, but even perhaps 10%. So we have a whole order of magnitude difference, and this is why the, the model is, is being employed as it is. So uh, another uh, set of preliminary results, Fish Creek, which is up by Steamboat Spring, <coughs> Spring sorry. Um, you can see this is the snow water equivalent uh, of the model based on, on April 1st. And below we have sort of the, uh, <coughs> the uh, graded severity. And you can see that you have some areas of deep snowpack in blue and purple, whereas we also have areas that are susceptible for bark beetle. And it's really the coincidence of these two areas, which I guess seems somewhat obvious, but it's the coincidence of those areas that actually matters in terms of how sensitive the basin is going to be. Um, I've got a few more slides here that just shows the difference when we add the bark beetle in um, and you can see that we generally see more snow water equivalent across the board, except for at the lowest line areas, for which at April, it, by, the, by the time we reach April 1st, those snowpacks are already diminishing, so we're on the falling line. And we're actually finding that the snow melt is slightly more rapid with the bark beetle, and that's what you're seeing there. The, 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 hydrologically, they're not particularly significant because they don't receive the same amount of the precipitation uh, that, that you would see in the other areas. Okay, so stream flow is kind of the last um, thing on everyone's mind. And um, these are still somewhat preliminary results. But the main issue here, and these are for four basins, we have um, a, a control simulation with no beetle impact in red. And what I think the first thing that kind of, um, that kind of strikes you when you see this is it looks like the impacts are very small. Uh, however, for going from the sort of the, the no impacts to the, the graded case in purple to uh, observed extent to maximum. However, what's important to see is not only do we have slightly more snow melt going on in these sites, but in the warm season, because of the lack of transpiration, there's also slightly more runoff. What does that mean for water yield? Well, I went ahead and computed that in acre-feet. And for the different scenarios, you essentially are getting anywhere between about 3% at the low end for the Elton Padre for the graded case, up to about 15%. Um, and again, these are scenario, synthetic scenarios. Um, so there's a sort of a range there. Well, what do the, the different scenarios mean in this context? So the difference between the graded and observed extent case speaks to how severe past events have been. 
or is the difference between the observed extent and maximum case speak to uh, the potential future severity, uh, sort of a worst case scenario? Okay. Um, the last part of this was the dust. So I've kind of separated the two, although we are working to combine the two in the future. We parameterize that using observation-based um, snow albedo values that uh, my colleague Jeff Dean uh, took in the uh, in Colorado, as well as a few other folks. And uh, essentially, they just make the mean that the days after a given storm, the snow gets darker faster, or get, absorbs more um, solar radiation faster. And the, the preliminary results there speak to these are the same four basins. Essentially, the, the, dust, the more dust you see going from low dust to moderate dust to extreme dust, the earlier in the season, which is somewhat intuitive, that the melt runoff uh, occurs. In terms of the total water yield, we're still kind of tackling a few issues there um, to do with whether it would necessarily uh, go down or up. We, we've seen some large scale results that you should have less water yield. But for now, the main message is that dust means earlier runoff. Okay. No. Did, yeah. Sorry, did you not detect in the, at least in the model output, a significant or consistent change in the timing of the peak runoff among the beetle scenarios? At this point, we have not. Um, but yeah, in the next step, we should have more concrete results. That's a, that's a good question. So, so far, it's looking like dust conditions, which have occurred numerous times in the last 12 years, are moving things earlier. Beetle is generally leading to larger uh, hydrographs with slightly steeper slopes. So, it's the combination of the two which we're trying to disentangle here. And so, some preliminary conclusions. We saw a greater similar runoff from um, the sort of competing of canopy and subcanopy factors, which is the the uh, lack of sublimation. And then in the warm season, we also see slightly increased flow due to lack of transpiration. And these bulk sensitivities are shown on the order of 3 to 15 percent change, depending on location and the sort of coincidence of uh, heavy precipitation with fetal impacts. It's a work in progress. Uh, I'm currently actually running uh, individual years with individual dust events and getting perhaps a slightly more refined uh, Results, so I would say stay, stay tuned, uh, keep checking our website, and uh, there is more to come. So, thank you very much. Thanks, yes, question. Well, did you add the Rio Grande above Del Norte? I As a case study, you <laughs> used the output by 4 p.m.? Yeah, uh, I would like that. If we have somebody who can help us set the model up, that would be good. Yes? Well, just the best, uh, you know, about the same intensity and all the water things, it seems like they're more frequent and more severe here down in the southern part of the state. Yeah, so my understanding is that um, the origin of the dust tends to be uh, further southwest from us, and it's sort of moving southwest and northeast due to sort of surface disturbance. Yeah, and so that Actually, in the uncompoggery basin, we have the largest uh, signal. That's where we have the best observation. So I think that relative importance of those two, the dust is actually going to be uh, more important in this region. Does that have any results? Yeah, well, we have actual, we have good inputs on the dust, and we're still not quite ready to say, um, to say that it is, although we have early signs to tell us it is because of the sort of steeper slopes in a runoff curve, which would indicate something is enhancing that. You spoke quite a bit about the reduction, the strategy for modeling the reduction in LAI. Did, did the model account for an increase in growth in the understory? Good question. So we have not yet, we have the ability to modify the understory independently, and that's kind of where we're at now in terms of those, because with the satellite, it's seeing everything. And we're seeing less change uh, overall, which is telling us that the understory is recovering from something there. And yeah, that, that's the logical mechanism. Yeah, like, that's why right, that increase in the understory would change the area that we 
Right, although there is the issue of, so you have your root zones, and when you get slightly deeper, a lot of that understory doesn't have access to that water. So that's kind of going to be the equilibrium. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah.